Hello and welcome to the Consistency Project with E.C. Sinkowski. My name is Patrick Cummings and every episode I have the distinct privilege of presenting E.C. with a question on subject matters that range from nutrition to fitness to the choices we can all make to live a healthier, more functional life. By exploring both the principles at play and the actions worth carrying out as a result, we aim to get you thinking, get you moving, and get you taking more consistent steps toward optimizing your well-being. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. And how are you, EC? I'm great. How are you? I'm excellent. Today we are going to talk about, I don't know if it's a tension, but we're going to talk about a tension between athletic performance and what that means or how that affects longevity, right? Mm -hmm. And so before we get into that, though, we want to make sure people know about something fun and exciting that you've been working on for a little while now. You've got the 800 gram challenge. I think everybody who's listening to this certainly knows what the 800 gram challenge is, but you've been hard at work at a, let's call it maybe a revamp, a specific product. So why don't you tell folks about that so that they know it exists? Yeah, totally. So I think most people probably know about the 800 gram challenge in the sense of gym challenges that I've had, but I also do or had a direct to consumer product that was 30 days of the 800 gram challenge and, and took that offline a little bit and, and now have revamped it. So, you know, you don't have to be part of a gym to get kind of the same content and education that you would get from an 800 gram challenge program. And so the idea here is, you know, maybe you've heard about the 800 gram challenge, you know, it's to eat 800 grams by weight of fruits and vegetables a day, but you haven't really jumped in and you want a little bit extra support. You want some answers to your questions. This is a great program to do that. It's not like a heavy duty, you know, master's level course in nutrition. It's simple, short content every day, answer some questions, give you some meal ideas, gives you like a shopping planner, strategies on Mm. the road, all this stuff. And the idea here isn't that you do it for 30 days and and you're done. It's 30 day kind of program. But the idea is you have enough support through 30 days that at the end, you know, you ride off into the sunset of nutrition consistency with fruit and vegetables. So if you're interested, it's at optimizemenutrition.com slash 800 G. Awesome. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes for folks. I really like that (laughs) simply because when I started the 800 gram challenge, when I did it, and this is ironic and not, but the hardest part was just getting it consistently done every day for the length of time necessary where it becomes, okay, I'm not actually putting any extra effort into this. I'm tracking it, but it doesn't feel like, okay, it's two o'clock. If I don't eat six apples in the next couple hours, I'm in trouble, right? And that 30 days, I think, is a really good on-ramp to getting to the point where maybe it's not quite a habit yet, but it's certainly less of uh, effort in just making it happen on a regular basis. Totally. And, you know, there's also like a Facebook group to support it and all that stuff. So the idea here is just like, make it easy. And that way you can kind of do it forever. You know, I've been doing it for quite some time now, and I think it's quite Mm -hmm. sustainable, but there people do need some help. So hopefully this helps with that. Got it. Okay, cool. So let's dive into this conversation about performance and longevity. This idea, at least we've tweaked it a little bit, but this idea first kind of came up as an idea that for us to talk about, I think he just does a video, I don't think it's a podcast, but with Dan Bailey, who a lot of folks might know from many years at the CrossFit Games and involved with CrossFit. And so there was a little clip that he shared that I thought was interesting. So why don't we start there, start with what that clip was kind of about, and then maybe where we're going to maybe take that and move it down a slightly different road. Yeah, Dan and I were talking about a whole bunch of different factors, but I did happen to talk about nutrition relative to performance. And I I think that's going to be a subject of a whole nother podcast. But Mm. part of the the idea there we were talking about is, is, is there a point or there must be a point at which performance and health diverge or Mm. move away from each other, go in opposite directions? And I made the comment that, you know, where that point is, we will likely never know because there's all these different factors, of course, that come into play in terms of both performance and longevity. And so I wanted to take a closer look at that. You know, what happens with longevity when we look at these high-end athletes? And I I think there's this universal agreement, for the most part, that we know that exercise is good for you. But then we get into like, okay, well, how much? And is more better? Mm. And how long, you know, should each day's training be? And of course, I think we both know that CrossFit has created faced a lot of criticism for like, that's too intense. And especially for the top end games athletes, right? Like, Mm. let's see what they're at, like at 60 and 70. So I wanted to take a closer look. Hey, what do we know about performance and longevity? So when you say longevity, just so that I understand, and we're kind of starting from the same place, are we just talking strictly how old is it when you die? Is that like literally the, the kind of the metric? Yeah, that's really where we have to start. They are just looking at kind of length of life. And of course, 
this is some of what CrossFit was trying to redefine a little bit. So they were kind of looking at quality of life. But yeah, yep. in, in the research, that is what they look at. How old are you when you die? Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So you wanted to take a bit of a deeper dive on this. Where did you start? What did you find as you started looking into whether it's the research or, or whatever it is? Yeah, I mean, I started with longevity, lifespan, and people's risk of death. What, what do we know about people who live for a long time? And at the outset of this, I have to point out, these are association or observational studies. We know we can't run controlled experiments <laughs> from somebody's birth until death across a large number of population. We can't control mm -hmm. all their diets and all the things that come into play. So I get it. When we, can't, we, look, we can't Truman show <laughs> right? enough people to, to get us actual no, facts. It turns out yep. we can't do that. And so <laughs> that's the biggest criticism of these studies. I've used that criticism before, but you know, I get it. We can't prove causation, but this is the best we're going to get. So, hey, let's deal with it. Let's look at it. Okay. So we look for people that live for a long time and we find that there's these cultures called that they've been called the blue zones where it looks mm. seems to be that people tend to reach a hundred at a higher frequency than other places in the world. And there's been five of these clusters. And yep, there's some criticism of whether or not the data is accurate. You know, do we have the birth certificates on the people who live to over 100, all this stuff? But, you know, this is really interesting because in the U.S., life expectancy is at this point 78 years old. And mm. so if you have a lot of people who are living into their 90s or even approaching 100, like, hey, this is interesting, right? And what these people who looked into these blue zone cultures found, which, by the way, let's see, Japan, Costa Rica, Greece, Italy, and there's actually one in California with the Seventh-day Adventists, but mm. they found that there's these nine pillars or practices that are common across these blue zone cultures. And three of them happen to be nutrition related. Two of them are not going to be very surprised at all, surprising at all, eat lots of plant foods, <clears throat> 800 gram challenge, right? And don't eat too much <laughs> quantity. But the other mm -hmm. one is actually to drink moderately, which some people will be happy to hear about. <laughs> and then the six... Do you think that that's... No, I, we yeah. can't move too fast, Pat. Do you think that's... <laughs> don't drink nothing, drink a little bit, or it's don't drink too much, drink a little bit. What do you, <laughs> what do you think is more accurately or what's more useful in that there? I, I think it's when you drink, it can't be too much. Okay. You know, there's never going to be an encouragement for people to drink. In fact, the Seventh-day Adventists don't drink. But when you do drink, it shouldn't be more than one glass okay. or one drink per women and, and two per men is what's been established. So they're not moderate. encouraging me to drink. That's no, good to know. No, no. Okay. <laughs> but then out of the rest of the nine pillars, there's six that are related to lifestyle. One happens to do with exercise. And then the other five, and I think this is really interesting. I did a social media post about this, but they're related to like community. What's your faith mm -hmm. community? What's your social community? How strong are your family ties? How low is your life stress? And, and, and do you have kind of a life purpose or meaning? Mm. Interesting. Okay. So you mentioned that exercise was one of nine. Mm. What can you pull from that fact, you know, as we start thinking about performance and longevity, where those things might correlate. Yeah, exercise is definitely one of their nine tenets. But, you know, it's really movement is what they call it. It's not quite like what we think, go to the gym and work out for an hour. It's definitely not CrossFit, you know, and it's not performance in the sense of the word of professional athlete, Olymp Olympic level athlete. And in fact, the way they describe it is moving naturally. And it's like, their lives just have more inconveniences, if you will, mm. because they don't have cars or they don't have mechani mechanization for all these things that we do now. A lot of housework, a lot of yard work, right? A lot of just life, you can think like farming chore type stuff. And so that's an interesting distinction too, right? It's not necessarily all this high intensity stuff. And I think we have to keep in mind that this again is one of nine pillars and mm -hmm. it's an observation. So we can't say that necessarily this type of movement or exercise program is what caused their longevity. But I do think we have a takeaway here in that, hey, you know, physical capacity is probably pretty important in terms of independent living, right? You know, that if you can't keep up with life, we're going to have a problem. And I think the phrase use it or lose it comes to mind, right? If you don't have that mm. capacity, we see that in, in ways that they measure it in current studies today. And I think the other, though, conclusion that you can draw from this is that high-level performance is not necessary to reach 100 years old. Mm, right, because you presume that they're not walking from, you know, their house to their neighbor's house with maximum intensity, right? <laughs> or they're not, they're not gardening for time. <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that the performance is terrible. It just means that it's not <laughs> necessary, right? Yes. Yep. How do you think about, then, the value of 
something like CrossFit or really kind of any sort of let's just call it man-made exercise, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Movement that is is not required, but that is desired to some degree. Does it work? Is it good simply because most of us, most of the time, don't live in a culture, in a world where we are spending mm-hmm. ample time in the sun, gardening, you know, moving cattle and sheep and hay bales and whatnot? Like, is it useful simply because most of us, most of the time, you know, are sitting or in front of a computer are not living an agrarian life? Yeah, I mean, I think we know that exercise is important and we continue to see that in our recommendations from the USDA, the CDC, you name it, they're going to recognize or they're going to recommend some level of exercise and that we can't necessarily look at these blue zones and say, okay, well, they just walked from house to house. So that is going to be my (laughs) ticket to longevity, right? Like we can't really recreate all of what they're doing. Well, for most of us anyway, right here and now, most of us, you know, can't kind of give up our jobs and try to do the farm life thing. I'm willing if you are. Let's get a farm. <laughs> I tried it in my Montana days, but I'm back oh, I to I forgot re- about your Montana <laughs> days. Oh, that's going to have to be a whole other episode. That's another podcast, but I'm back <laughs> to reality here of a lot of sitting in front of the computer. But yeah, I mean, I think there's, again, a, a, a kind of a carry through in that we know that exercise helps. It's part of our basic recommendations for health and that, you know, it's it's one of the factors that can dramatically risk reduce our risk for chronic disease. And so I think it's logical to assume that if we have some of those practices in place that, yeah, we're going to be better off and whether or not that's through CrossFit or or doing more walking around, you know, all of that stuff that, yeah, that's going to be a good thing. Okay. So what does that mean then for the performative element Mm -hmm. of fitness, of exercise, of sport even? How do we then balance that, what you just said about the blue zones and the fact that that's clearly not what is getting them, getting most of them to 90, 100 years old. How do we balance those two things? Or or what did you learn about that coming out of your research? Yeah, I mean, so then you have to look for, okay, do we have data on high-level athletes, right? And I actually was pretty surprised from what I found. And I think it was because I assumed that high-level athletes would be no better off or perhaps just the same as what our kind of average life expectancy was. And in a pretty large study by, I think you pronounce it as Garatechia, in the 2014, it's in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, but they looked at more than 42,000 elite athletes. And we're talking professional level sports athletes, we're talking Olympic athletes, they had a mix of power and endurance events in there. It is worth it to note that most all were men, like over 90% of them were men. But Mm -hmm. they found that these athletes had a decreased risk of death, like 30% less less deaths by age. And that was true even not just looking at it across the board in terms of any cause of death, but also looking at it specifically for cardiovascular disease and even in terms of cancer, which are, of course, two common causes of death. And I guess I was a little bit surprised because I think I, you know, have been susceptible to the camp of thinking like, okay, that's just so much stress on your body, right? And having that mm. skepticism about the training volume, like, is that really good for you long term? I mean, I've, I've certainly heard it by people besides myself, right? And mm-hmm. yet what we find is that these these high-end athletes are living longer. And there's multiple studies that, that find this conclusion. And this was actually a really interesting one that I found. I just thought it was so interesting that they tracked down these these men. But it was in 2018 in the Lancet, they found the first 20 runners, male runners, who were to run less than a four-minute mile. Mm. And they figured out, you know, when did they die? And they found that 18 of those 20 kind of exceeded the expected longevity for their country and time by 12 years. Now, Mm -hmm. that's a super small study, right? 18 out of 20, it's an association study. I get the limitations of it, but it's interesting nonetheless, because arguably a four-minute mile has significant volume of training and stress, right, on the heart and the body. And so it's not like this group was all keeling over at age 50. So, Mm. yeah, I mean, it looks like, again, based on association, these elite athletes actually do better off in terms of longevity. Mm. Would you say that what CrossFit has been able to do introduce, allow people to become in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Would you consider people who do CrossFit with some amount of consistency and whatnot closer to those elite athlete that perhaps that study was paying attention to? Maybe obviously CrossFitters aren't Olympians. They're not right. They're probably not running sub four minute miles, but are they closer than perhaps what the average person would be? And if so, what does that teach us, if anything? 
Yeah, I think CrossFit is good for that in the sense of it pushes people to work a little bit harder. We're going to kind of get into where that might fall off and if there's risk associated with that. But yeah, I mean, Mm. stress is good for the body to a degree. (laughs) You know, it, Mm. it does drive a lot of favorable adaptations. It does make us stronger. It does make us more resilient. It, it, we talked about it in the, in the, in the inflammation podcast that, you know, potentially it even has some protective effects against anti-aging. And so I do like CrossFit for that reason, because it has pushed people to, you know, work harder. And when you work harder, generally you have a positive outcome associated with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So assuming though, with that in mind, I assume that one of the lessons here isn't well, we should all be working to get a sub four minute mile, right? So where do us normal folk, what can we take away from this to be able to apply it to our own lives? Yeah. I mean, just because these four minute milers are living into their late eighties doesn't mean that we need to run out today and think, okay, well, that's going to get me to 90. Like I need to get this yep. four minute mile. I, I think that <laughs> what is more important than necessarily thinking, okay, it was just their four minute mile. And what I should have been more keyed into before looking at this is, you know, I bet those people that achieve a four minute mile, or I get bet those people that are professional soccer players, I'm, I'm also willing to bet that they don't gain as much weight on average, that they probably don't Mm. smoke. They probably don't drink as much and so on and so forth. We're just looking at a healthier population. And so it's, It might not be just the exercise. In fact, I'm willing to say it's not just the exercise, which is part Mm. of their longevity equation. You know, we mentioned some of those benefits of exercise. It's it's one of the best anti-aging strategies that we've got. But it's it that's all relative to what we know about modern life in the sense of, you know, sitting around too much, eating too much. And I think our professional athletes, they're gonna adhere to healthier practices at least for a longer period of time you know, if not their entire life relative to an average population. Mm -hmm. You mentioned stress Mm -hmm. before. I don't know if the criticism, I don't even know if there was any truth to it, but one of maybe the criticisms that we would hear regarding high performance, training, exercise, sport, whatever, is maybe that this question of like, is that stress on the heart Mm -hmm. healthy? Is Mm -hmm. that actually a good thing? Are we sacrificing the long term for whatever kind of gains we can get in the short term? Did you find anything as it relates to that when you were reading? Yeah, this was interesting. I mean, there is, I certainly have heard it over the years, you know, too much stress on the heart. And again, mm. I think it's like inflammation. We keep, and I already mentioned it a little bit, but to say it again, words like stress and inflammation, we don't, we shouldn't think about them as inherently bad. I mean, stress is what drives change and adaptation. It, it's the dose that makes things good or bad, right? Mm. And so, yeah, stress on the heart is what makes it stronger. It is what allows us to, you know, pump more blood, drive more oxygen flow, all of that stuff, just like stress of lifting heavier weights. But this is something that is interesting that there is, again, it's an association, but a trend that very high volumes of training, high volumes of endurance training, there is a greater risk of atrial fibrillation or AFib. Mm. And that's essentially an irregular heartbeat, a regular heartbeat, not good because it puts you at risk for heart failure and stroke. You need that thing, obviously, pumping blood and (laughs) oxygen all the time, right? Now, we usually find AFib is there's a higher risk with obesity, you know, lack of physical activity, smoking, too much alcohol, all these things that we kind of hear about all the time. But there also seems to be a higher incidence of that with high volume endurance athletes, like chronic multi-hour training days can increase your AFib risk potentially five times more than, let's say, non-extreme mm. train, training volume. And I know when people hear that, the first thing that they're going to say is, okay, hours, tell me the number of hours, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's the exact <laughs> cutoff point? Yeah, I mean, no, no single number is going to be hold, hold true across everybody, right? But let's say several hours a day. Now, what's really interesting about this is, so these athletes tend to have a higher risk of AFib, but going back to that mortality data, do they or do they die at a higher rate? You know, maybe mm-hmm. I have AFib, but am I more likely to die now? And no, you're you're better off being an athlete with AFib than not. And so you're less likely to die when you have that irregular heartbeat versus not. And, and in some cases, it's good to point out that AFib is treatable. So like when you look at these mortality studies, I mean, some of these include like Tour de France cyclists and, you mm-hmm. know, these endurance skiers who go for 90 kilometer races. I mean, we're talking about the high end of probably volume and training, right? And they're included in these mortality studies that, that they find on average, they live longer. 
Okay, so given all that, given that as best we can tell, more exercise, more intensity, more stress, at least we, we can't say that it's bad, mm -hmm. right? At least what that's kind of what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. How good it is, how impactful it is, I think is probably the question mark. But mm -hmm. so what do we do with all that now? What do, what do we do kind of going into our day to day? How do we adjust if we do what we're doing, how we think about fitness and exercise and, and all that? Yeah, I mean, we're just back to the abyss of the unknown. <laughs> I mean, yeah. health and wellness and nutrition. You see, and <laughs> I come to you for answers. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just <laughs> what's hard about this stuff. I mean, and we don't even have, we haven't even talked about genetics either. I mean, yeah. maybe you're prone to develop AFib, but you don't end up choosing endurance, extreme endurance yep. sports, right? Or, or maybe, and there's every combination of that. Maybe you're not prone, but you do do extreme, whatever. I mean, so we know these big picture broad brushes, like you just said, we know exercise is good, but then the details that everyone wants is going to be way less clear. And again, that's some of the problem with these association studies is we can't really draw conclusions on anything. And that's why you got to think about this as risk tolerance. And I, we've definitely mm. talked about this to some degree before, but exercise is routinely associated with less risk time and time again, mm -hmm. even at high end athletes. And it, it looks as though it might even be a continuum where top end recreational athletes, which I would say is kind of where you are going with the CrossFit yeah. question, right? Yep. They seem to fare better than let's say the average exercise population, but they're not as good as the elites. When we look in terms of this death risk, that's again, in this study of over 40,000 athletes, but that's all relative to the modern average life. Like we don't have these Olympic athletes living up to a hundred, you know, those four minute mm. milers, for example, again, died in their late eighties. And so this is where we come back to the blue zones, you know, does high end performance prevent the longevity Does it prevent us living to a hundred insert shoulder shrug, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the movement component there was not high end performance. And I think that's where we have to take that step back and recognize that the blue zones, they have these nine pillars, right? Exercise was not the only one. It's one of many. So I think at the end of the day that we can look at the guidelines that we've heard about for so many years and accept them as, as pretty good guidelines. You know, the, the activity guidelines for Americans by the Department of Health and Human Services, they say about two and a half hours a week of moderate intensity or an hour and 15 minutes of vigorous activity. And that if you double that, that you have additional and more extensive health benefits. That would be five hours a week for moderate activity or two and a half hours a week for vigorous activity. And they want you to include mm -hmm. some strength component as well. And so this is where I think CrossFit's really good, right? I mean, we get that variety. We get that strength as aspect. We get that endurance component sometimes. <laughs> and if you were to take five classes a week, I think you're probably pretty close to that hour 15 minutes of vigorous activity because that would be like five mm -hmm. 15 minute workouts right i do think you have to remember that and this is no slight on crossfit classes that there is some downtime in those hours and that people don't often go five days a week so i do encourage yep. even the crossfitting population to in, to include some other type of movement you know our lifestyle is pretty sedentary i can spend a lot of hours in front of the computer and so you often end up having people who you know maybe they're doing three crossfit classes a week and that's it that's great now maybe let's add in some walking you know make it a family mm. event listen to i don't know a podcast something like that mm. and i think that's a way that we can really achieve some of those exercise standards that i think are are very i'm very comfortable saying that those yeah are going to put you in the right direction it feels to me that we emphasize or we overemphasize the importance of exercise, given everything we just talked about, given the mm. nine pillars, given obviously all our conversations around nutrition and the importance of that, that we put a lot of emphasis on exercise as almost being a catch-all or a, I'm not going to do other things, but I'll go work out a couple of times a week and, and I'll be okay, right? Mm. Like, but what, one of the things I'm kind of pulling out of this is, yes, of course, exercise is important, but it's not more probably important than the other eight things, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense that we think exercise is a fix that it isn't? And that's maybe mm -hmm. part of a confusion or part of why so many people run into so many trouble when it does come to their health and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing is knowing that it's a piece of the puzzle that it in of itself is not going to do it, right? I mean, yeah. you know, the exercise intensely for 20 minutes a day and then eating the pint of ice cream isn't it either. We, yeah. we might end up being better off. In fact, I'm willing to bet it with less exercise and less ice cream, <laughs> and right? No ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. or no ice but cream. It, but, it, but it transcends not just the, the nutrition, but right, something that you 
that we've talked about, but the stress, right? It's mm. probably not useful to work out four or five hours a week and then go to a job that you work 14 hours a day and you don't sleep enough mm-hmm. and, you know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I just, I sometimes think that we think that exercise can fix things that perhaps it can't because that's not the point of it i agree you know there's so many things that we can singularly focus on we even talked about it in the last podcast just about nutrition getting too reductionist approach you know if we get so obsessed about exercise we've probably missed the boat if we get so obsessed about our back squat routine but don't have any clue about how stressed out we are during the day you know (laughs) that's that's missing the whole picture and in fact this risk or this the AFib risk actually goes down when people have a decrease of life stress. No surprise. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes people are diagnosed with it because they're they're highly stressed and then their their heart goes back to a regular beat when they're not. So, so it's just like, again, we can never take this like this is going to be the one thing. I do think, though, it's always useful. And this kind of comes up with the consistency project and a question you had asked me about before. And it's like, if that's, though, your weakest link that's your weakest aspect, you probably have the most to gain there. Like if your life is relatively unstressful and you're doing well in terms of nutrition and then you do no exercise, you know, the next place to look is to add that exercise component. Yeah. Try to bring them all rising together versus one as this amazing outlier and then the other are so far behind. Anything else as it relates to this conversation about performance and longevity worth mentioning before we say farewell? I think that's it. We got it? Yeah, we nailed it. (laughs) All right, my friends. Thank you all so much for tuning in, for leaving ratings and reviews. And do make sure you check out the new revamped 800 gram challenge that we talked about at the beginning of the show. And we will be back very soon with another episode of the Consistency Project.